Hi, this is the introduction to programming for the class COMP 1010 at the University of Manitoba. I'm Dr. Celine LaTulip, and I'm a professor at the University of Manitoba, and I'll be creating a whole bunch of slides and movies for this class. Hope you follow along. Okay, so what is computer programming? In my opinion, computer programming is one of the most cool, creative, exciting things that you can actually do in this world. So here's a movie that shows what I did when I was doing my PhD in computer science, and I decided I wanted to be able to use two hands when I was using a computer to draw. So I created a program that allowed me to plug in two USB mice to a computer and then get two cursors on screen and do all this cool drawing in new ways that had never been done before. So check out how you can actually make this um, oval fit inside the rectangle. And I made these menus, I designed these menus and I programmed them to show up on screen. Now I'm making this oval go around the rectangle. So I was able to make really cool things that had never existed before and allowed people to draw in ways that had never been possible before using a computer. Watch this curve. I actually get to steer it around the screen. So computer programming is really fun. And it's not just fun, it can be really meaningful. You can think of anything that you care about in this world, and you'll be able to use computer programming to develop applications and programs and devices and tools that can help make the world a better place. If you care about crops and farms, you could make a computer program that works on a desktop for a farmer that connects to sensors in the soil. If you care about women who are abused by their husbands, you could create a mobile app that helps detect cyber threats from that ex-husband who might be abusive. If you care about children, maybe you could make a, an app for that goes on a keychain to help children avoid being bullied. There's all sorts of different things you can do. And once you learn how to do computer programming, the world is just opened to you in really fun ways. So computer programming is what I consider a logical art form. It's an art form in the sense that it takes skill and practice and sometimes you've got to have some intuition and, and you, you learn how to do things in a really interesting way, sort of the way art artists learn and master their skills. But it's logical because computers at the heart of it are really stupid. They only do exactly what they tell you to do. So you write a set of instructions and they're followed by an idiot. So you have to make sure that, that the instructions are super specific and really, really clear. Um, they have to be in a language that the computer can understand. And that set of instructions are what we call the program. So in this class, you'll learn how to write computer programs that computers can run. So here's an example of a computer program. And if I wanted to just tell a computer, hey, I want you to draw me a rectangle, I can't just say it like that. I can't say, I want you to draw me a rectangle near the top of the screen. I have to get really specific. And so here's an example of a program where I get really specific about how to draw the rectangle and where. All right, so with computer programming, you're kind of solving problems. You've got something you want to do and you have to provide a set of instructions which might seem very similar to a recipe. So you've seen recipes before. It's a standard way to represent how to cook something. You could also think of computer programming as being similar to music composition. Everything in this musical score specifies how that music will sound and, and how to make it sound that way. So again, I can't say this often enough, computers are really stupid. They only understand concrete, simple, unambiguous instructions. You have to be really, really specific and you have a very limited language that you can talk to the computer in that the computer can understand. That's the difficult part, that's the challenge. But the great thing is, is that computers are incredibly fast. So how fast are they? Well, a common computer today might be a three gigahertz computer. That's how fast the computer runs. And what that means is it's got 3 billion cycles per second. So it can do 3 billion calculations per second. Right now, that's a pretty slow computer actually in today's standards. Lots of computers today, you can get, have multiple computer processing units on them. They're called cores. So you might've heard of a dual core or a quad core. So imagine that you have a computer that has six processing units on it, a six core computer. That means that 
At any given point in time, it can do six instructions in parallel, one on each of those processors. So that's 18 billion calculations per second. That's a lot. Computers are really fast. So even though they can't guess what you mean, they can do a lot of things really quickly. So I think it's important for you to have some idea of how computers work under the hood. So what's inside that box that makes computers work even when you do succeed at giving them a really clear set of instructions? Well, instructions get translated into um, a series of sort of switches, ons and offs. So this is something that we call binary. So a switch can be on or off, it can't be in between. And on is typically known as one and off is typically talked about as zero, so ones and zeros. So a bit of information is either on or off. It's either one or zero. And you can put eight switches or eight bits in a row and you get what we call a byte. But this is just a series of ones and zeros. And this is actually a number system. The number system is binary. We're all used to the, the decimal number system where we have 10 digits. In binary, all you have is zero and one. So everything has to be represented this way. And what this is, is actually, you can think of it as a, as a series of electrical pulses that the computer reads and understands. So I'm gonna show you what I imagine this in my head to look like. So this zero is a low voltage. So if we have high voltage up here and low voltage down here, and we wanna take the zero, we're gonna send a low voltage signal and then the next thing is a one, so we're gonna send a high voltage signal. And then we have another one, so we're gonna send another high voltage signal, and another one, another high voltage signal, another high voltage signal. And then we've got some zeros, so those are low voltage signals, and we've got three of them. And so you can think of this as a series of electric pulses that are being run through a computer really quickly. So this is like the electricity is off and then it's on, 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 off, 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 right? And this gets interpreted by the computer. So these bits actually mean something. And if we were to take those, this series of eight bits and translate that into our number system, that actually becomes the number 120, okay? And what's interesting about the number 120 is not really very much, but numbers like this actually can represent the number 120, but it could also represent letters. So we have something called ASCII, which is a way of representing letters for the computer. And if we look at 120 on this ASCII table, we come down here, 120 actually maps to the letter X. So maybe by sending this series of pulses, ons and offs, high and low voltage to the computer, we're actually telling the computer, we want the letter X to be stored in memory or printed on screen. And so that is a, a really quick high level overview of how computers get information and how it's stored and how they are transmitted through electrical pulses in, inside your computer. Okay, so early programming looked a little bit different than it does today. So in early programming, the big early computers didn't have um, keyboards and screens and electrical switches the, the way that we think of today. This is the ENIAC computer and it had like vacuum tubes and to program this computer, these computer operators had to plug and unplug these tubes and connect them to different areas. So almost all of the early computer operators were women, by the way. Um, this was a lot of work, lots and lots of labor to set up this thing to program and do calculations. All of these tubes had to be plugged and unplugged. So that's a lot of work. And this thing could only do 385 multiplications per second. At the time, that was considered insanely fast. By today's standards, it's insanely slow. So after a while, it became obvious that this was really inefficient and they came up with this punch card system. So this is a picture of an old punch card and you can see that things, are, things that are punched are ones and things that are not punched are zeros. And so these things would be read row by row by row and 
that would be the way to get the computer instructions into the computer so that they could be understood as everything is either ones or zeros. So ones or zeros basically is what we call machine language. Um, and so a big long series of ones and zeros like this one here might mean something like add one to the score. And you can imagine that figuring out all the ones and zeros and entering all these ones and zeros would be mind numbing and super tedious, really, really difficult to do. And so very early, something called assembly language was developed. And this was like a way to make it a little bit more readable. So in assembly language, we could have keyboard commands that you could type in short words that would actually give instructions. So here we might have something like load score, add the number one, and then store the score. And so this might be the same as what was up here in machine language. And this is a lot easier to think through and to type on a keyboard than it is to set a whole bunch of switches to on or off for these ones and zeros. So assembly language basically introduced a level of abstraction. It got us away from this low level ones and zeros and switches and allowed us to think a little bit more the way humans think with words. And there was something called an assembler program that would take something like this assembly code and turn it into all the ones and zeros that the machine would understand. Nowadays, we have high level languages. Um, and this is really good because they are definitely much more human readable. Um, so that you don't have to work either in assembly code or in binary. And the, the language, human um, readable high level languages might look something like this. So here's a statement, score equals score plus one. And then here's something that's a comment. And this is just for us to understand what this does. This is adding one to the score. Fortran was the first high level language that was created. And there've been lots and lots, there's hundreds of different high level programming languages. One of the most popular that's commonly in use is Java and it was created in 1995. In this class, we're going to be using processing, which is a sort of a simplified form of Java that was developed in 2002. It was developed mainly for artists to use to make it easy to get visual output up on screen really quickly. Um, and so it's a lot of fun to use and we'll be using processing. The syntax, which is sort of the rules for writing the, the commands and the instructions is the same in processing as Java. So once you learn processing, you can go and switch into programming Java pretty quickly because they're almost identical. There's just, process, Java is bigger than processing. There's more things in Java than there are in processing. And so this is what a Fortran program looked like. So you can see it starts to look a little bit more human readable, um, provides a little bit more flexibility than the assembly um, code from the last screen. All right. So here's a basic Java program, and this starts to look more like sentences in written English, although it's still a little bit strange when you've never seen it before. Um, there's these brackets and there's, there's these special words. Um, and you might look at this and go, I can't make any sense of that. And that's okay. You don't need to know how to make sense of this right away, but you might be able to pick out some things that start to look familiar, like print and hello world. And those are like quotation marks. And in fact, this very short Java program, actually all it does is prints out the text, hello world onto the screen. So if you run this program, it looks like this. It just says, hello world. And just so you know, hello world is the most common first thing that people do when they learn a new programming language. It's the very first step is figuring out how to get something printed out to screen. And traditionally everyone always writes hello world as their first program. So here's a basic processing program and processing is designed for artists. So typically we're going to be drawing things. You can of course write text, but what we want to do in, in processing is, is draw shapes often. So this one line, very simple program draws a line to the screen. So there's a keyword here line, there's some numbers. And when you run this program and in processing, they're called sketches. So when you run this sketch by pressing the play button here, a little window pops up and there's the line that is drawn. And so 
We'll learn more about how all this works, but this draws a line from 0, 0, so these are coordinates, to 10, 10. So 0, 0 is the top left corner of the screen, and 10, 10 is 10 in and 10 down, and so it drew this little short line here. So processing, basically, you might wonder what happens when you press that play button? How does it all work? The sketch that you write is um, a processing sketch and it has a .pde extension if you looked at it in your file system. Processing takes that sketch and turns it into Java source code. So it creates a file that ends with .java and then that's run through a Java compiler. And the great thing about Java is that once the Java compiler has taken the .java code and compiled it, it creates something called Java bytecode. And this is kind of like assembly language, but it can be sent to all sorts of different kinds of computers. So almost every computer out there that exists nowadays has a Java virtual machine on it, often referred to as the JVM, and it can run that Java bytecode. So you might be working on your Windows computer doing processing, it creates a Java file and it gets compiled and then that compiled Java code can run on a Mac, it can run on a Windows machine, it can run on a Linux machine, etc. So it doesn't matter what platform you develop on, your Java code can run on other platforms, which is a really cool feature of Java. Okay, so to summarize what we talked about today, really important to remember that computers are stupid, they can't guess what you mean, they don't do what you want them to do, they do exactly what you tell them to do and nothing more, but they're really fast. Um, you can make lots of fun and interesting and really important um, world-changing things once you learn how to program. So it's worth doing, even though it might seem hard and challenging at times. And processing, which is the language we'll use in this class, is a simplified version of Java. It allows you to make applications that run on various different platforms. All right, that's it for now. See you next time.